This morning, I want to read from Psalm 99. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Let's pray. Father, we know you are good. Lord, you are holy. Lord, we know that that through the cross of Jesus Christ, Lord, we have the ability to be holy through you, Lord. Lord, just continue to be with us, continue to guide us, continue to just lead us each and every day, Lord, as we just continue to to walk in your ways. Lord, would you continue to change us into being more and more like you. Lord, as we sing to you, Lord, help us to concentrate on you, who you are. Lord, let these words flow out of our mouths. Let them be a prayer of thanksgiving, a prayer of encouragement, a prayer of thankfulness, a prayer of praise to you this morning, Lord. Lord, as we hear the word preached over us this morning, Lord, I pray that you will just send your spirit to go before. Lord, I pray that your spirit will lead, it will convict, it will encourage this morning. Lord, I pray each and every moment of this service will be an honor and glory to you. And I pray that we, as we leave this place, Lord, we will just have a heart and a desire to do the things that you've called us to do. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Would you all stand with me as we head out of the video? There we go. Yeah, you are good. You are good. 
with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you our Christ. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't walk heaven without us, so Jesus you brought heaven.
All right. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you so much for all the good and perfect gifts that come from you. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for Emmanuel, for God with us. We beheld, we get to behold the face of Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Father, help us to see what life is about today in more depth than we did yesterday. I ask you to open our hearts and minds to receive your word. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, guys, we are continuing our sermon series in the book of 1 Samuel called A Heart for the King. Uh, David was described as a man after God's own heart, right? And, but he isn't, he isn't the only one that can or should be after God's heart, right? So we've been, look, we've been starting these messages with the summary of the events from Samuel found in Acts 13. And in Acts 13, uh, the summary is, they asked for a king, Israel, God gave them Saul, a man of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed Saul, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. And so I believe that David has a heart for God because he's willing to do whatever the Lord asks of him. And so we look at that and we should be like, well, that was for David. No, we need to look at that and be like, okay, I want to I tap into that. Are we after God's heart in our living? Jesus said we actually line up with all the law and the prophets when we love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself right? And no one did that perfectly but Jesus. Amen? But we should seek that same mindset. Jesus wanted to follow the Father's will, and he did perfectly. We should, we won't follow the Father's will perfectly, but we should want to. And so we need to have that same attitude, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And so last week we look at the call of Samuel. He, he did not yet know the Lord on a relational level, okay? But that all changed after God called him. And so if you, brother or sister, if you know the Lord, he has called you out of darkness, out of darkness into his marvelous light. He has a purpose for you if he calls you. He doesn't just call people willy-nilly. And so we're called to a mission, a mission to spread the gospel of the glory of God that permeates everything we do and are. And so we should meditate on what God has called us to do in work, role, or whatever function we find ourselves in. Life has meaning. And so we need to, one of the things we need to do is we need to take up our cross and follow Jesus daily. Amen? Even when our days don't feel great and they're not, don't look glorious at all, we need to take up our cross and follow Jesus. And so the sermon title for today, Where is the Glory? Where is the Glory? We're going to be looking at 1 Samuel 4, and I will warn you, the, two weeks ago we had uh, some light among the darkness with what was going on in Israel with the wicked sons of Eli. Uh, this passage, the light is way in the background, okay? Way in the background. But we can remember that God is at work from that context given, especially in that prophecy given back in chapter 2. So let's go ahead and jump into the word, and may God add a blessing to his word starting at verse 1. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the troops came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, and it may come uh, among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. 
And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, what does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, a God has come into the camp. And they said, woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they may have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated. And they fled, every man to his home. And there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. And the ark of God was captured. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. A man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and with dirt on his head. When he arrived, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the sound of the outcry, he said, What is this uproar? Then the man hurried and came and told Eli. Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were set so they could not see. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. He said, How did it go, my son? He who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. There's also been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backwards from his seat by the side of the gate. His neck was broken, and he died, for the man was old and heavy. He had judged Israel 40 years. Now his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant, about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed and gave birth. For her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women attending her said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have born a son. But she did not answer or pay attention. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because the ark of God has been captured, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. It's the word of the Lord. And all God's people said, thanks be to God. The glory has departed from Israel. It's a sad and despairing narrative, right? And I'm going to tell you at the outset, Ichabod, as we just read, is not a great name. It's a terrible name, right? It means no glory. Or, where is the glory? Regardless of which one you go with, Phineas's wife concludes that the glory was no longer with Israel. The glory, or the presence of God, had left. Now, I love to think about the presence of God, how God is always with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the most comforting thoughts that you can share with a brother or a sister in time of need, right? Yeah, but, hey, God is with you. The Lord is with us always. But here... We see a moment in Israel's history where Yahweh didn't appear to be aiding his people. So it's important to remember he's still at work behind the scenes. He uses the Philistines to hit the spiritual reset on the leadership and the direction of Israel. It does certainly appear, we have to agree with Phineas' wife somewhat, it does appear by the circumstances that the glory had departed, it exited. But it's never God's faithfulness that should be questioned. Amen? God is always faithful. And we'll talk about that. The Ark of the Covenant takes a spotlight. So we're going to leave Samuel behind for a little bit from chapters 4 to 7. And the Ark of the Covenant takes a spotlight. So the Ark, just in this passage, is mentioned 12 times. And so let's go ahead and walk through uh, this passage together. Verse 1, the word of the Lord came... Uh, to, to Israel from Samuel. The prophet is established. Israel went to battle against the Philistines and they encamped at Aphek. Aphek. Aphek is a little over 20 miles, about 22 miles west of Shiloh. That's where the uh, location of, of the tent of, of the priesthood was located after the taking of the promised land. The Philistines were considered sea people. They were driven out of Egypt but dwelling in the Aegean Isles near the coast of Canaan so they kind of didn't have a place to be. They didn't really fit. They were supposed to be driven out completely, but Israel did not accomplish that. And so we see them come up 
from time to time in the book of Judges. And this isn't the first time that God had allowed the Philistines to be victorious over Israel. But the Philistines drew up line, and when the battle spread, Israel defeated, was defeated before the Philistines, and they lost 4,000 men. And so the question comes, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? And so we, we can't just jump past the significant loss, by the way. 4,000 people died in the first battle, right? That's a lot of people. Why were they beaten? It doesn't appear much thought, though, is given because right after, why has the Lord defeated us today? Oh, you know what? Let's bring the Ark of the Covenant out, out of Shiloh to here that it may come among us and save us. Let's get the Ark. Shoot first, ask questions later. Sometimes we need to wait, right? Sometimes we need to wait, ponder, meditate, pray. The Bible speaks heavily about waiting on the Lord. In fact, the Bible speaks to both sides of the issue that's taking place here. And so the Word speaks to us about rushing into things without thought or prayer. And that brings us to the first point. Desire without knowledge is not good. And whoever makes haste with his feet misses his way. That's a proverb. Proverbs 19.2. Speaking of rushing in to the unknown too quickly, to be a hasty person, right, is not a compliment. To be a hasty person is not a compliment. It makes you lack patience, exhibit a lack of careful thought or consideration. You're a rash person. And so this verse from Proverbs describes a greedy or impulsive person who whose decisions or actions follow their reckless wants. And at times, why don't you think about this, any of us can be blinded by surface-level wants from discovering heart-level needs. Okay? We can be blinded by surface-level wants from discovering heart-level needs. We think we always know what we want. We don't. Israel's want is clear. What is it? I want to be rid of the Philistines. Get rid of these guys. There's a time to act. There's a time to wait. But haste wins out. Let's just make the problem go away. Right? You notice that, too, though, that they understand. They actually have good, good understanding of God here. Why has the Lord defeated us? He didn't say, not why did our enemies defeat us? Why did God beat us? Because they understood that the victory belongs to God. Right? They had a good understanding of the capability of God. All things are possible. Grasp the sovereignty and power, but the question comes out. We are God's people. What happened? Our God is the true God. Why is the Lord allowing the Philistines to beat us today? Good question. So what could they have thought about here instead of like, hey, let's go get the ark? You know, the law of Moses, you find scriptures like Leviticus 26 that says, uh, if you will not listen to me, do these commandments. Those who hate you shall rule over you. You shall flee when none pursues you. Or we could simply look at Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28 is the chapter uh, that contains all the curses for disobedience for Israel. And verse 25 says this, The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. You should be a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. This is the old covenant stuff here. If you're disobedient. And we know they were disobedient. But we know they weren't thinking about this deeply either because the hasty consensus, guys, let's just get the ark. Let's just get, make the problem go away, get the ark. It's helped us before. And so I'm, I'm not going to assume. You might be thinking, like, what, what is the ark? What is the ark of the covenant? What is that? Is that that thing from Indiana Jones that they open up and everybody, ah. Well, it is, but that's a fictional representation of it. So let's describe it from, uh, I'm going I'm to use Dale Ralph Davis's commentary. The Ark of the Covenant, sacred, gold-covered, gold-covered portable box. It was three and three-quarter feet long by two and a quarter feet wide and high. Unless Israel was on a march through the wilderness, it sat behind the thick veil in Israel's worship center in the area called the most holy place, the tent right? The tent of mating. The ark's full title is the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts. 
enthroned on the cherubim. So the, the, the lid that has the cherubim on it, those are the angels. The, there's a lid, and that's often called the mercy seat, which was sprinkled um, by the high priest with blood so the, to make atonement just to be in the presence of God because the unmitigated glory of God would kill you. Let's just, let's just put it that way. We cannot stand before the presence of God. So, Raiders of the Lost Ark, great movie. They get that right. When, when it, like, if God was present there, which it wasn't, it was fictional, but if God was present, we would not be able to stand before him as we are. We need a great high priest. So they might, they might have been thinking, so, so if there was any contemplation, it was Numbers 10. Numbers 10, 33. They set out from the Mount of the Lord, three days' journey. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord went before them, went before the people. And the cloud of the Lord was over them by day whenever they set out from camp. Whenever the Ark set out, Moses said, Arise, Lord, let your enemies be scattered. I remember my, my dad talking to me about Moses doing this and how his dad told him that and how the Ark would go out and the enemies of God would just scatter away. The ark led them. The ark guided them. It led them across the Jordan River. Joshua 3 through 4. The, the Jordan River parted and the ark went before. But was Israel commissioned to get the ark out whenever they wanted? The pattern was God told them when to bring it out. Right? When to put it up, when to bring it out. The Lord had not commanded this. The people demanded it. It was used here as a morale booster. Verse 4, So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. This is storytelling, right? If you've been following along for the last few weeks, these names look very familiar. And they're listed there for a reason. These are the worthless sons of Eli, and this is foreshadowing what had been stated before. So the Hebrew, back in verse 3, by the way, can also be about God saving the people, can also be translated, God will have to save us. Isn't that interesting? God will have to save us. He's, he's, he's not going to be mocked by his enemies, and we are his people. God won't allow us to lose if we have the ark out, right? Because that looks bad on God. That's not faith, right? That's not faith. That's an attempt to strong-arm God. It's like, hey, man, hold you, hold you. Look, you're not going to let yourself. This is going to be you losing if you let us lose here. This is trying to work it up and bend the Lord to our will. But we can't do that, can we? We can't do that. The ark was being used as nothing more than a trump card. And it was like Israel was like, I got the ace of spades. Here comes the ark of the covenant. And we always win with it. Lucky clover, lucky rabbit's foot. Take your pick. There's a difference between submitting to the power of God and trying to tap into the power of God for your own purposes. How do you view, church, how do you view the God of the universe? How will we worship God in the highs and the lows? Will we remain faithful and submit our lives to him no matter what's going on? Do we realize he's worthy of it all in every season? Winter storm, summer heat wave? He's worthy of it all. We can't only cry out to God when we think we need him, right? You're in danger right there. And I hesitate to even say when we need him because we always need him, right? We always need God. And so one thing, it's, it's one thing to want God to come and solve all our problems. It's another thing to want God through your problems, Okay? I want God there even if I have to deal with the problems. You will have a problem, and not knowing God is the biggest problem that you can have in this life. But we should want God, I'll take life on hard mode if God is there in it with you. It's, it's, it's always worth it to go for God no matter what problems we face. So verse 5, as soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, here we go, everybody gets excited to the point where the earth resounded, Woo! There it is, boys, up behold the ark. We're saved. That's a sign that the Lord our God, he's our God. We're a chosen priesthood. We're a royal nation. 
think of like a locker room setting, right? You know, a locker room for game, game time? Like a, or, or maybe like a boxer walking out to the ring or a wrestler. They got the lights going off and everything, and everybody's like, yeah, ready to go. But God doesn't work like that. Even if the earth shakes from thunderous applause, it's powerless before the Lord. Just because you project strength doesn't mean you're strong. You can look strong and be weak, and God is not a good luck charm. God is not your good luck charm. He's the Lord of heaven and earth. Verse 6 and 8, verse 6 through 8. When the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, what does this great shouting of the camp of the Hebrews mean? It looks like this, this, this you know, grand entrance and morale boost is working, right? They learned about the ark. They'd heard about it. And, and, and you know, you've got to give them a break here. They, they don't have great theology but, because they talk about a God, right? A God has come into the camp. And who will deliver us from these mighty gods? These are the gods that struck the Egyptians. It's understandable. Okay, guys, they didn't live in the age of Twitter. Okay, they didn't know everything. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't get on the internet and uh, read the, or they didn't have a Bible. They didn't know. And so civilization has changed a little bit, and they get these few things wrong, like a God. Yes, we know. The Lord is one. One God, three persons. Amen? These are the gods that got the Egyptians in the wilderness, and that's actually wrong, too. Despite the Red Sea crossing, all the plagues happened where? In Egypt, not the wilderness. But these are pagans with limited knowledge. Verses 9 and 10. Take courage and be men, Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought. Israel was defeated. And this is bad. Very great slaughter. 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. Uh, I would say that the Philistines were more encouraged by what Israel tried to pull than discouraged. And it's obvious by the results. And you wouldn't think it could get any worse, and then the Bible's like, hey, and the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. This is bad, right? The glory, the ark of the covenant, the peace said to hold the very presence of God, was gone. So let's sprinkle some light on this dark moment in Israel's history with the second point. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. This is also in your Bible. So we go from thinking about Ichabod, but we know this. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. It comes from Habakkuk 2.14. As the waters cover the sea, that's, that's pretty good coverage. The whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Wasn't well, it already? The glory is the presence of God. We have the presence of the Holy Spirit, but we don't have full, unmitigated glory that awaits. We have not experienced that yet, okay? There is more. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what the Lord has in store for those who call upon his name. Look here, the Apostle Paul told us in one of his later letters after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, Romans 8, 18, if you're a note taker. For I consider, so the, the, the Holy, this is past Pentecost. This is one of Paul's last letters, in fact. And he says this, Romans 8, 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Where is the light of the glory of God in 1 Samuel 4? The prophecy from chapter 2 comes to pass in the death of the wicked sons of Eli. That's what's happening. Verse 11. Wicked sons of Eli. And not only that, they lose the Ark of the Covenant. They lost the symbolize, what symbolized the presence of the Lord. Well, they, thought, they thought this thing, the Ark, was going to be their salvation. Didn't work out that way. What they thought would save them, slayed them. And that's why we can't forget that prophecy. God is, clearing, cl God is clearing the slate with the priesthood. 
and he uses the Philistines to restore Shiloh. What were these Israelites trusting in? And you got, we can ask ourselves this today. Like you think of, um, think of the movies where you've got like some kind of weird demonic force. You shouldn't watch those movies, by the way. But um, you, you've got, and the reason I don't like those movies is because they always have like the good guys lose. Like here comes the priest or the preacher or whoever. He's got a crucifix or something. He's holding it out. And then it's like, oh, he doesn't win anyway. It's like, so that's, that's not right. But yeah, God has not given you a spirit of fear. He's given you a spirit of power. Amen? Lord, the demons are subject to, our, uh, to your name through you. We, those movies are wrong. Let's just put it that way. But point, they always have their cross or their stuff or throwing them at them like that. It's like, no, you, that's good. That's, that's fine. You have symbols. But are you trusting in God or are you trusting in the object? And that's exactly what happened here with the Israelites. Were they trusting in the box that represents God or were they trusting in God himself? And so how would Israel receive the news of the loss? We're going to move a little faster now. So a man of Benjamin, he runs. This guy needs a trophy. He ran from Shiloh the same day. Clothes torn, dirt on the head. And when he came to the city, he told the news, and the city cried out. And Eli heard the sound of the outcry. He said, what, what's going on? What's the uproar? And so you see the posture. Don't miss the posture of the messenger. His clothes are torn. There's dirt on his head. And that's telling of the kind of message that's coming. It's not beautiful. This is not how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This is not beautiful. This is a posture of grief. Job 120. Job he arose and tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground and worshiped God after he was going through his loss. And then his friends show up, Job's friends show up in chapter 2, and in verse 12 it says, And they saw Job from a distance. What do they do? They didn't recognize him. He didn't look like the same Job. And they raised their voices and wept, tore their robes, sprinkled dust on their head. It's a posture of defeat, of melancholy. It's not good news. And the reason I say this guy needs a trophy is this messenger ran about 20 miles in the same day after a battle. He's got to be tired. The Bible tells us that Eli, don't miss it, trembled for the ark of God. See, Eli, and I think we saw that in chapter 2. Like Eli was well aware of what his sons were doing, but he didn't do anything about it other than say, hey, don't, that's bad, don't do that. Oh, don't do that, don't stop that. That's as far as it went. Could have got a little more heavy-handed with him there, Eli. But he knew it wasn't right for them to take out the ark. It's, it's, it's consistent. He knew it wasn't right for them to do it. He let them do it anyway. He didn't say anything. And he might also have been thinking about the prophecy he received. So Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were set, so he could not see. We're quickly reminded that he can't see well at all physically, and now the news of what happened at Aphek was going to come in three parts. And you ever tell someone you got bad news, right? You might, maybe you call them on the phone. You got some bad news, and you're like, hey, man, you might want to sit down. You might want to sit down. That didn't get out. Okay, that didn't, uh, clearly. Verses 16 through 18. The man said to Eli, the messenger, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. How did it go, my son? And so the, the, it comes in three parts. Three-part report gets excessively worse. Number one, well, Israel has fled before the Philistines. There's also been a great defeat among the people. That's bad news. The people lost and were routed. We lost 30,000 troops. Number two, that 30,000 includes your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. They are dead. And third and finally, the ark of God has been captured. And that right there is what did it. That did it. As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backward from his seat by the side of the gate and dies a rather graphic way. His neck's broken, for he's old and heavy, and he judged Israel for 40 years. So Eli's reign as judge comes to an end. We're moving on from that, or as priest, I should say. And so just as the prophecy he received... From the man of God, 
it has come to pass. Verse 19 through 20. Well, meanwhile, it's got to, get, it's got to be better somewhere, right? It's got to be better somewhere. His daughter-in-law, Phineas, was, Phineas's wife, was pregnant and about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed and gave birth. Her pains came upon her. And about that time of her death, the women attending her said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have born a son. Hey, cheer up. Born a son. That's, that's good. You ever get one of those calls? You want to hear the good news or the bad news? Right? You want to hear the good news or the bad news? It might, and it, and it depends. Like, it's always hard to answer that question. Like, when you're on the other side, I don't know. Because you don't know what they're going to say. It depends. Good news doesn't always cancel out bad news, though, does it? How good, how bad. And so it was seen as a great blessing, right, to receive a son from the Lord. And, and we know that children are a blessing from the Lord. The Bible tells us that. But even the blessing of childbirth for Phineas' wife was not enough. The gift of life is wonderful, amen? Life is a wonderful thing to celebrate. But because of the loss of Israel, she could not think, and, and her own family, all she could think about was death. She's surrounded by death. And so despairing that she names her child a horrible name. She names the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because the ark of God has been captured. My father-in-law and my husband are dead, and so the glory must have left. Because not only that, the ark of God has been the ark of God has been taken away too. There it is. Ichabod. Ichabod. The opposite of kabod. Kabod is the Hebrew word for glory. I've talked about that before. Uh, it means heavy, weighty, gravitas, God's presence of, of glory. And so Ichabod is when all the heaviness, all that, that significance, all that gravitas exits. And so why did the glory leave? What happened? We know those guys were having, they weren't being priests. They were being, they might as well have been on Food Network. They were using the sacrifices of barbecue time. H.L. Ellison writes, the glory didn't leave because the ark was captured. The ark was captured because the glory was gone. That's what happened. The presence of the Lord had left due to Israel's disobedience and the wicked sons of Eli. You come back to one of our most, uh, com uh, our initial thoughts, I should say. One of the most comforting things you can be told is the Lord is with you. Amen? You got a difficult season coming up, the Lord is with you. You got an easy season coming up, the Lord is with you. Amen? Some tra some traditions like to say it back and forth to each other. The Lord is with you and also with you. Right? So Joshua was told that when he went to take Canaan, remember Joshua? That was positive. Joshua says, I be strong and courageous. I'm with you. I'm with you, Joshua. Jesus tells his disciples in his church at the end, that he is with us until when? The end of the age. He's always with us. Now I want you to take that, that high feeling that you get from thinking about God is with me through thick and thin. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because my, the Lord my shepherd is with me. Take that feeling, flip it on its head and reverse it. And that's what you have here. No, the Lord has abandoned you. The Lord and his glory have departed from you. That's not neutral. Like That's not even maybe God's with you. No, God's gone. Does he leave us? Hebrews 13.5 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. New Covenant. Romans 8.39, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Right? John 10.28, no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. My sheep hear my voice and I call them by name. He doesn't leave us or forsake us. But the book of Revelation talks about some churches in Asia. 
that might have lampstands removed if their behavior doesn't change. And then in Ephesians chapter four, we're told that we can quench the spirit. We can quench the spirit. And our behavior can have an impact on the success of our ministry. And ministry, by the way, is not, not measured by the, your numbers. It's measured by your depth and your truthfulness and your faithfulness. And, and the health of a church is always measured by one simple thing. How much do you make of Jesus Christ? That's it. And we could add, because they, they, work in co- they work together, we could add to that, how much do you love Jesus Christ? How much do you love God? That would be, how much do you make of Jesus? And how much do you love your neighbor? This is how we know that we know, that we know God, that we love him, that we love the brethren. Jeremiah 7, 14, he said this. He, this, can ha- this happened later in Israel's history. I will do to the house that is called by my name in which you trust and to the place that I gave to you and to your fathers as I did to Shiloh. Not the first time, not the last time that God allowed their enemies to defeat Israel. And so we got to ask, can Ichabod happen today? Well, we got we to look again at what caused Ichabod. Why was it Ichabod? The glory of God is in our gatherings. Amen? But God is not mocked. God is not mocked. There are churches that stop centering around God. They, they go through the motions. They water down things. They exhibit half-truths. They, they take this word and they bend it to say what they want it to say. And they think they can do it and mock God and get away with it. And may we never think we can do that. Let me just tell you that. We can, we can try to change or augment things or water things down or tell half-truths, but God is not mocked, and whatever a man sows, he shall also reap. And churches also can go toward that Ichabod direction when they take the focus off of Jesus and his gospel as being relevant. That's, you know, old. Not important anymore. They practice a dead faith without any substance and replace what the Bible says with their own words. The church in Sardis, guys, they had a reputation for being alive. But the letter that God said, but you're dead. You're dead. You can allow the culture to influence worship more than Scripture. And once you do that, once you make church pretend or club, you're on your way to Ichabod. Now, I'm talking about an environment, okay? Because the tent of meeting was an environment. We need relationship and discipleship, amen? We don't, we don't pit those things against each other. We don't do the vain repetition thing when we have our liturgy. We don't just pretend that, you know, God is out there and, you know, we're just going to come here and we're going to go through the motions, we're going to sit, stand, and kneel, and that's it. That's not the Christian life. But we also don't pretend that none of that stuff matters. We need a relationship and discipleship. We don't pit those things together. We experience them together. We need the glory of God. You and I need it. It's what changes us, okay? The glory of God transforms us and shapes us. 2 Corinthians 3.17, you know that one. It's on the foyer. The Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, what is there? Liberty. Amen. And that's a Christian liberty. I love the liberty that we get from old glory, but the liberty that comes from Jesus is even better. So the question becomes, can Ichabod be reversed? It gets really, really bad. Why did God do this? To reestablish the priesthood through Samuel. Zechariah 1 3. This is hope right here. Therefore, say to them, thus declares the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, the Lord of angels' armies, and I will return to you. Call out to God. Where's the glory? The glory is in the presence of God. Where's the presence of God in the new covenant? 
presence of God is with the people and the person and the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's where the glory is. And to come in fullness, and one day it's going to come in fullness in the, in the new heavens and the new earth, there'll be unmitigated, full glory. We don't have to be hidden from the face or, or from directly looking upon God, for we will be able to do so. And that's amazing to think about. And from, we're going from glory to glory. 2 Corinthians 3, 18 says that. For we all with unveiled, unveiled face, behold, the glory of the Lord are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. From the glory of Jesus calling upon, or us calling upon Jesus as Lord and Savior to the glory of spending eternity with him free from sin. And how do we become aware of that glory? Through the proclamation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that Jesus suffered, crucified, died, he was buried, and on the third day he rose again. And when he did, he defeated death. And he ascended into the heavens and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And whosoever calls upon his name, will they die? Because you will die. The death rate is very, very high. It happens and it comes to all of us. And so the question is, what are you going to do when that day comes? Because everyone who dies in Christ, though he dies, yet shall he live. And he will ascend into the heavens with Jesus Christ as well. From glory to glory. Worship team, come up. I want to close with 2 Corinthians 4, 6. God said this. If you think I'm just, you know, and, and I know it's, it's, it's hard sometimes to get this perspective of what's really, really important in life, but this, God said this. God said, let light shine out of darkness as shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You were made for glory. You're made for it. Where is it? It's in God. It never leaves us, never forsakes us, and never forsakes us. The the glory of God is his godness that changes us and reminds us that there are greater desires available. Morning by morning, from glory to glory, there are new mercies to be seen. And I want to tell you this, just as in a side of comfort, Ichabod never comes to those who know Jesus and have a heart for the king. Amen? Search your heart. Do you know him? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for difficult passages and encouraging passages of Scripture. Help us to always put ourselves in subjection to your word and spirit that we with unveiled face will continue to be transformed from one degree of glory to another beholding the face of Jesus Christ help us to do that give us grace to do that extend your grace upon this congregation and beyond so that your glory will spread more and remind us that one day the whole earth will be filled with your glory in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing this last song? Oh,
good church you know it's like <clears throat> when I was a kid I'll say this real quick when I was a kid like if somebody if I heard somebody talking about um, anything super serious like that I'd be like dude you need to lighten up right you need to lighten up man um, but I'll, I'll just say this and I'm not trying to be clever but it's it's hard to lighten up when you're talking about the glory because by definition the glory